Today's episode of Dog Nation Daily is brought to you by Meriwether and Tharp, your source for Georgia divorce. Find them online at the Atlanta Divorce Team.com. Presented by DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. I want to begin today's show with a really fun announcement. Uh, before we're done today, about 45 minutes or so from right now, 1045 in the morning if you're watching live, and then uh, around the 45-minute mark or so if you're listening or watching on demand later on, we're going to welcome onto the show today the great former Georgia coach Mark Richt. going to be on hand on our program today. He's got a really fun event he's a part of in a couple of weeks. We'll tell you more about that. But uh, just really, really excited about having Coach Richt on the show today. I think there's a lot we can talk to him about. His stamp, his fingerprints, obviously on this Georgia team right now in a very big way. And so that'll be a fun discussion. We'll get to that here coming up in just a little bit. And plus, no one's been happier about the success that Georgia's enjoyed over the course of the last couple of years, seemingly more so than Coach Rick. Coach Smart's told us some stuff about that over the course of time. The text messages they've exchanged back and forth, they've clearly had a good time with all of this. So it'll be our pleasure to welcome in Mark Rick to the show a little bit later on today. And I am very very excited about that prior to that by the way Terrence Edwards is going to join us today as well as he always does on Thursday prior to that I find myself in a position I don't really enjoy all that much because it's hard not to sit in front of a microphone every day without sort of falling in love with your own opinions I guess from time to time but every now and then you kind of look back on it and you're like "Mm, maybe I'd like to have that one back maybe I might have gotten that one wrong And I think in one particular area, I may have gotten something wrong, and I'll kind of lay it out here for you. You can kind of judge for yourself. And ultimately, this really isn't a topic about me, but I do think it is a good way to frame the stakes in place for Georgia this upcoming season. Let me set it up this way. You may have seen this. I think this is really interesting. We've kind of kicked off talking season around college football. SEC Media Days, of course, is next week. But we also have Big 12 Media Days that have been going on this week. Now, this is a brand new version of the Big 12 that's ever existed uh, before because you got you know all kinds of new entrants into this league. One of those is Houston. And the uh, coach of the Houston Cougars is Dana Holgerson, who recently took a visit to Georgia, part of coaching clinic stuff and things like that. He spent some time around Kirby Smart, spent some time around the UGA program. And he told ESPN during an interview yesterday just how impressed he was with the Georgia program. And I think the the specifics of the comment here from Holgerson gets a lot of attention. And for you know, at least one aspect of this, it kind of becomes kind of a cool way to sort of, if you're a Georgia fan, rub this in the face of Alabama fans, which uh, dog fans kind of enjoy doing from time to time. But there's also a larger point to be made here. So let me read this to you. It's fun. This is from an interview that Holgerson did on ESPN. And obviously, it sets us up to talk about Georgia today. So let me show, let me show you this on the screen. We'll read the quote. He says, uh, Holgerson on ESPN uh, talking about uh, Georgia. What they're doing in Athens right now is on a whole nother level. I've been to a lot of NFL camps. I've been to Alabama. I've been to a lot of places, Dana Holgerson says. But what they're currently doing at Georgia is on a whole nother level. Just the commitment from the athletic department to the funding, to how they're feeding them, to how they're practicing, how they're lifting, what the staff looks like. It's big time. And clearly it works because they're back-to-back national champs. Once again, that's Houston coach Dana Holgerson, a part of Big 12 Media Days here this week. Now, you can kind of approach that particular quote from a lot of angles. You know, it kind of is fun to sort of rub this in the face of Alabama to say, hey, ha, ha, even this coach right here shows that he knows that right now Georgia is on, as Holgerson says, a whole nother level, kind of dropping the uh from the beginning of that word, whole nother level on top of the rest of college football. And to, see, to hear Holgerson, who kind of has a little bit different kind of understanding about this, kind of diving into the granular level of I've seen the nutrition, I've seen the weight room, I've seen the the approach to the financial part of, of all of this. Uh, I don't have this quote to show you, but later on that same kind of discussion with ESPN, Dana went on to say that it's actually impacting the way in which he's going to run his own program there too. And this is a veteran coach who's been at West Virginia, been at Houston, been at places like that. And, you know, after a while, coaches set in their ways. But this is one of the reasons why they travel around, participate in each other's clinics and just hang out and, you know, 
nothing coaches like doing in the summertime more than hanging out with other coaches and just sort of sharing secrets and you know you know whatever else and Holgerson basically came back and said hey we're gonna start doing some things at least to the extent that we can we're gonna start doing some things the way that Georgia does it because as Holgerson says the proof is in the pudding the last two national championships demonstrate that Georgia is on a whole nother level than the rest of college football and this is where it kind of wants to you know it kind of leads me to I guess sort of reconsider some of the things that I have said here during this offseason one thing in particular on Tuesday I was on 92.9 the game that's a sports radio station in Atlanta and one of the hosts who was interviewing me asked a question this is a totally fair question it's probably an appropriate question to ask given the fact that Georgia has won two national championships how do you define success for the upcoming season in fact we've probably talked some about that on the show here ourselves over the course of the last few weeks last few months the premise of the question is basically now that Georgia has won national championships does that mean this season is national championship or bust for UGA in other words is a national championship the only way you can define success for Georgia here this year and I answer that question this week the way that I often do and I do truly genuinely believe this is mostly true in most cases that even for a program like Georgia or programs that play at a level near Georgia, the Alabamas, or the Ohio States, or the, maybe the LSUs or somebody like that, that if you put yourself in a position to contend for a national championship, if you kind of navigate your way through the regular season, if you can get into the postseason, if you can make the college football playoff, then there's a certain understanding that needs to be in place that once you get to the CFP, anything can happen. The Georgia-Ohio State game a year ago is an example of this. It was a knockdown drag out. The game literally could have gone either way. George was uh, you know, able to win that game there, but, but, but certainly the game could have gone the other direction. And that's kind of the way the college football playoff is sort of supposed to be. It's supposed to be close. It's supposed to be maybe a little bit of a coin flip that things you know, can happen when you get there. And your goal as a football program, almost if you think about this the way that a poker player would think about it or somebody like that of, hey, just give yourself enough chances, put yourself in, in, in contention status enough years, and eventually if you're good enough and you're there as a contender long enough, the odds will be in your favor to reap some, reap some championship success over the course of the long haul. That's genuinely the, uh, you know, and generally kind of the way that I, I guess I sort of believe on that. And so if you use that as your guide, then what I said on the radio this week, what I may have said on the show to you all before is, well, maybe that means that Georgia doesn't have to define success this season as narrowly as just a national championship. That even though Georgia's won the last two, it doesn't have to be championship or bust mentality for Georgia here right now because even if they don't win it in 2023, they're not going anywhere in 2024 and on and on and on and on. And that is probably a reasonable answer. But when you hear Dana Holgerson, the Houston coach, saying what he says there, all of a sudden I do think this frames the upcoming season, the one we're about to have here in 2023, a little bit different for Georgia because I believe that what Holgerson says is true, that Georgia is on a whole nother level. And on the one hand, you want to sit back and enjoy that, appreciate that, as a lot of Georgia fans say from time to time, these are the good old days. We're in them right now. We're enjoying them. We're experiencing them. Experiencing them. But simultaneous to that, it's almost like you don't want to give any of that back if you don't have to. Right now, I would dare say that really no one's on the same plane with UGA. Yes, as I mentioned, Ohio State played it close with Georgia last season. But this is an Ohio State team over the course of the last few years that's just sort of had a hard time maintaining the consistency that Georgia's maintained. They've been incredibly deficient on the defensive side of the ball. We'll see if that changes this year. That's been a big issue for them now for uh, quite some time. Ohio State is not on the same plane as Georgia. Alabama at one point in time was on a plane by itself, and Georgia was trying to work its way up to Alabama. For now, it sort of seems like that scenario has flip-flopped itself a bit. Alabama lost twice in the regular season last year, as you know. Georgia has won the uh, last two national championships. The status that Alabama and Georgia once had, at least for the moment, appears to have flip-flopped. Georgia fans hope that is maintained in the future. Alabama fans are hoping their team changes that here this year, but that's kind of the way that things stand right now. Dabo Sweeney has won two national championships with Clemson, but the team that Clemson fielded a year ago felt like a far cry from those championship teams from just a few years prior to that. In other words, it is just self-evident, I believe, that no one right now is playing at the level of Georgia. And so if you're Georgia, you want to maintain that. You want to maintain that gap that exists between you 
and everybody else. You don't want to give back the edge and the advantage that you currently enjoy because there is a way in which this can all kind of spiral and snowball and kind of compound on itself where if Georgia could find a way to win another championship this year, then all of a sudden it enters into a new era of college football, 12-team playoff in 2024, and all the things are going to be going on there with literally so much distance between itself and its next closest competitor that the idea of Georgia building I mean, as sort of outlandish as this sounds, the idea of Georgia building an unprecedented level of success moving into this new age of college football, that would at least be a possibility. But if Georgia were to somehow not win the championship this year, which is very, very possible in its own right, but if Georgia were to somehow not win the national championship this year, then all of a sudden you're kind of talking about Georgia moving into the new age that college football is about to enter kind of on a plane with somebody else, kind of competing among equals with either an Ohio State or an Alabama or one of these teams that might emerge, potentially LSU, I guess possibly USC, you know, whatever the teams you might want to consider. That's really what the next 12 months are about. Does Georgia have a legitimate equal contender for future national championships, or is Georgia just playing with a house edge moving forward? And obviously there are going to be a lot of teams who think they're positioned to match Georgia, Uh, And very possibly one of them might step up and do it. College football is, after all, a very competitive landscape. But if Georgia can prevent that, if Georgia can participate in another year in which the gap between itself and whoever's next, second best in the country, feels as large as it did a year ago, then all of a sudden you're talking about the buildings and the makings potentially of something very, very special uh, at Georgia. So let me kind of sum up what I'm trying to say here, and then we'll move on and talk about something different. Holgerson, the Houston coach, says that Georgia is on a whole nother level. And I think just the evidence that's out there would suggest that's true. So if you're Georgia in a roundabout way, that puts more pressure on you this season to go out and compete and make sure that stays the way that it is. Because if Georgia can win a third national championship in a row here in 2023, there is no telling how many more national championships they might be able to collect in the future after that. My name's Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans presented today by Meriwether and Tharp, your source for Georgia divorce. Uh, we get started for you at 945 every morning, uh, Monday through Friday, right there on the Dog Nation homepage and the Dog Nation app. We call that our first and 15. Then at 10 a.m., we're live across the rest of the video platforms, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch. We look forward to being on the radio at noon every day on Athens, Sports Radio 960 The Ref, and as a podcast. Apple, Spotify, the world famous dog nation.com. So many different ways for you to be a part of our program. We just really appreciate you picking one of those platforms and using it. And hopefully that's uh, working out to your satisfaction there. And a big thanks to our friends at Meriwether and Tharp who make it all possible. Meriwether and Tharp, as I said a moment ago, is your source for Georgia divorce. Now, here's what that means it means that for one of the most challenging situations you might ever deal with, the divorce process, someone who has been through that situation thousands of times wants to be able to lend you their expertise, their calm demeanor during all of this, because let's face it, the idea of your own divorce is not an emotionally neutral topic. It creates a lot of feelings on the inside of you, and sometimes very intense feelings can lead to decisions later on that you might regret. Well, that's what Meriwether and Tharp sort of is in some respects. It is an insurance policy against future regret, that when you make the decision to hire Meriwether and Tharp to handle you for your divorce process, to walk with you as an advocate as you go through that. Uh, The odds are greatly increased that when it's all said and done, you say, you know, obviously divorce is tough and it's painful, but going through this, I set myself up for, you know, everything on the other side of that divorce process to make me happier and more fulfilled in kind of that next season of life. And that is what Meriwether and Tharp is going to be kind of all about for you. And I don't want you to just sort of take my word for it. I want you to investigate them because they make it very easy to do so. If you go to their website, the Atlanta divorce team.com, the Atlanta divorce team.com, you can see free resources, blog posts, podcasts, things they put out there with really, you know, no strings attached, just consume this content educate yourself about how divorce can impact you there's probably a lot of things that you are thinking about that you should be if if you know history is my guide on this there may be several things that you're not thinking about that you might need to be aware of well that's what those resources at Meriwether and Tharp are all about and then you can have that free initial consultation with one of those Meriwether and Tharp attorneys 
And after that, I think you'll be ready to do what thousands of others have done, which is to hire Meriwether and Tharp to handle your divorce situation and be that advocate that walks alongside you through all of this. So please find them online, the Atlanta Divorce Team.com. That's the Atlanta Divorce Team.com. Meriwether and Tharp is your source for Georgia divorce. Let me reset what I told you a moment ago that two big guests on our program today, Terrence Edwards, the former Georgia wide receiver, as always on Thursday, we'll get a chance to talk to him, and I'm looking forward to doing so. And then before we're done today, special guest, the uh, terrific former Georgia coach, Mark Richt, going to be a part of the program today. All of that is on the way. We'll do that here in just a bit. Prior to that, let's go around the doghouse today, presented by our friends at Serve Pro. And I probably was not a very good friend to my uh, buddy Jeff Sintel yesterday because Jeff had reached out to me to say that Joseph Jonah Ajanye uh, was going to be his guest last night. The recent four-star defensive line commitment for, uh, to UGA was going to be his guest last night on Before the Hedges. I know I mentioned that to some of our video audience, but I don't know that I mentioned that as well as I could to the larger audience yesterday uh, that uh, Jonah Janye was going to be on Jeff's show. Well, it took place, and so now uh, my invitation to you is if you did not hear uh, JJA on with uh, JS, Jeff Sintel, last night. You can go to the Dog Nation YouTube page. You can find you know any of the platforms and connect with Before the Hedges presented by Kroger and hear Joseph Joan Ajanye last night. There's several things that kind of got mentioned about what's next for Georgian recruiting. Obviously, uh, Joan Ajanye had plenty of opinions about that. But there was one thing I wanted to pull out in particular, and we'll have Jeff Sintel on the show tomorrow. We'll talk more about this. One thing in particular I wanted to pull out. We have seen Georgia really make a renewed commitment as if they needed to uh but a renewed commitment to the lines of scrimmage you know you recently go out and get four four star offensive linemen that's a pretty rare feat to even sign that many uh, uh offensive linemen of that caliber in any recruiting class georgia got commitments from guys of that caliber four of them over the span of nine days that is heavy lifting when it comes to recruiting and mixed in with that was a defensive lineman the caliber of joseph jonah Janye there as well that if you look at and just to still itself down to the basic element, the basic essence of why Georgia's been so successful, I believe line of scrimmage play is just the reason. It's just the thing that makes Georgia Georgia. And it's cool to hear Joseph Jonah Janye last night with Jeff Sintel acknowledging that himself, that this is a program that clearly values offensive and defensive lines. And that brand of football is not going out of style anytime soon. We can make a big deal about Heisman quarterbacks and five-star wide receivers and all of this, but big guys getting it done in the trenches is still what this sport's all about, and it's kind of cool to know that a future member of all of that, Joseph Jonah Janye, last on Before the Hedges, was speaking those words himself. This is what he told Jeff Sintel. They show their big men a lot of love, and obviously as a, as a big man, I obviously want to be there and receive some of that love. So, yeah, I like the way they prioritize that because games are won in the trenches because if the D-line can't create pressure on that quarterback, he's obviously going to make a great throw and win the game. But if we can, he's, he's going to throw a pick at the quarterback, and that's a pick six, you know, <laughs> or if you give offense back the ball. And that's, how, that's how games are won. That's how you win national championships, in my opinion. To borrow a line from the movie Jerry Maguire, a great movie from back in the 90s, you had me at hello. (laughs) If you're talking about getting a bunch of pressure with a great defensive line at the line of scrimmage, uh, deflecting balls, creating pick six, just getting off the field, giving the offense back to football, uh, I like that brand of football. It's worked out very, very well for you, GA. And making sure you stay strong with that defensive line is a big way to be able to do that in the future. And this is sort of one of the cool parts of the Georgia recruiting apparatus. These big men recruitments, defensive linemen, even, you know, for someone like Joseph Jonah Johnny, maybe more of like a sort of five technique type guy moving forward. But these big, uh, you know, big men type guys, you know, they are obviously long range recruitments. You know, you got to be in it for a while. You've got to show yourself to be, you know, kind of a dedicated force in pursuing their services. There's just never going to quite be enough of them. It's always going to be a scarce commodity in the recruiting process. And that is one of those things that Georgia just continues to be very good at. And to hear Jonah Janye there talking about just how much he likes the fact that Georgia values that really on both sides of the ball saying they showed the big men a lot of love well guess what that's a pretty good way to do it in football because having the very best most athletic big men 
is one of those ways to really sort of separate yourself from the rest of the competition, which, as we said a little earlier, is something that Georgia has definitely done. So really good stuff there. You can hear the full interview with Jeff Sintel, Joseph Jonah Ajanye. Go to the Dog Nation YouTube page. That actually might be the easiest, most convenient place to go collect that. So you can do that there. I, I just think that's uh, terrific. And that is also Around the Doghouse, presented today by our friends at Servpro. And as terrific as an interview like that might be, one of the things that's not terrific is some sort of damage to real estate that's important to you, whether it's your personal home, your commercial property that your business is housed in, something like that. When fire happens, when water damage takes place, it leaves a gigantic mess. Some of you have seen this before. Some of you have seen evidence of people that you know. And trust me when I tell you, if you ever experienced that in you know a place that's important to you, whether it's your business, your home, whatever else, the big question you have is how do you put all this back together? How do, you, how do you get all this cleaned up? Well, that's where the restoration specialist, my friends at ServPro, can step in and do this for you. Because what they do is they step in, they participate in the cleanup process, and they put it back together for you like it never even happened. No evidence, no residue left behind, literally as if the event that took place that caused the damage in the first place never even happened. That is what ServPro is all about. Every franchise independently owned and operated. What that means is when you do business with ServPro, you're also doing business with a company that's got a vested interest in a satisfactory outcome just the same way you do. That's why I love talking about them each week here on Dog Nation Daily and around the doghouse. So please find them online at servepro.com. S E R V. Servepro.com. You want to get your mess, fire, water, whatever caused it cleaned up like it never even happened? That is what our friends at Servepro are all about. So find them today. Servepro.com. S E R V. Servepro.com. All right. One more time. Uh, we'll talk to Mark Rick a little bit more than 20 minutes from right now, 22 minutes or so from right now. We'll talk to the former Georgia coach, Mark Rick. That'll be a fun conversation. Obviously, he's had a lot of cool things going on as of late, including within the last year being uh, announced as a member of the College Football Hall of Fame. So we'll celebrate that and more with Coach Rick here in just a little bit. But prior to that, there is a lot going on around the Georgia program here right now, and no better voice to discuss all of it than a guy that's deeply entrenched in everything involving football at the college level, at the high school level, and everything else. So let's talk to him right now, the great former George wide receiver, Terrence Edwards, here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Meriwether and Tharp. From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. Always love the chance to get a uh, conversation going with Terrence Edwards here, terrific former Georgia wide receiver. And uh, Terrence, we were just hearing from Joseph Jonah Johnny, a recent Georgia defensive line commit, talking about the love that Georgia shows to its big men, offensive and defensive linemen. Now, you're a skill position guy, right? You're a wide receiver. But I'm guessing you, when you played at Georgia or when you see guys playing at Georgia now, I'm guessing wide receivers, skill guys, you know, they understand the value of, hey, if I've got defensive linemen that can force those turnovers, get the ball back, that's just good for me. If I've got offensive linemen, like the ones that Georgia just brought in as of late, who are opening holes and, and, and moving bodies, once again, that just works out well for me. So I'm, I'm guessing that even the skill position guys like the love that Georgia shows to these big men because big men – it is still a sport where big men matter and uh, and lines of scrimmage are still really, really important. Kind of cool to hear uh, Joseph Jonah Johnye saying that on Dog Nation last night, right? Oh, most definitely. Uh, w- w- we understand where the the play starts and, and ends. It, it, it starts up front. You know, you got to have guys that are able to protect and guys that are able to get after. So Georgia's done a, a great job since Kirby's been there. It's getting the – Bigger men, more powerful men, and the more skilled men um, in his defensive and offensive front. So uh, us skilled guys may get all the glory. We may score all the touchdowns, but we know where where it begins, and we have to show those guys more love. So early in the show, I read a quote from Dana Holgerson, the Houston coach, about the way that Georgia, he said, is kind of on a whole nother level from the rest of college football. And Holgerson was saying this after having visited Georgia a little earlier this summer. And – I ask you this because, Terrence, I know that you have seen Georgia practices several times. You also kind of watch this from the standpoint of somebody who, you know, played the game, obviously coached the game now. And, you know, I get a chance every now and then to go to Georgia practice too, you know, not as frequently as but maybe you do and certainly don't watch the entire practice the way that sometimes you get a chance to. But the thing that always strikes me is the pace with which these – 
practices operate and the precision with which all of this seems to be taking place. And you know how it is. When you got, you know, 100 some guys out there running around, it can sort of seem like mass chaos, but with the Georgia practice, it never does. It's energetic and people are running in every single direction, but everyone seems to be doing that with a purpose. And when a guy like Holgerson comes in and sees the operation, he walks away saying, well, it's obvious why they've won the last two national championships. And I guess I was sort of hoping that as someone who kind of watches this stuff as a coach yourself and as a, you know, former player, you know, what is it like to sort of see inside the Georgia program and the commitment the the team seems to have to sort of doing everything and at the highest possible level, so much so that a guy like Holgerson says, hey, if I could model my entire program, or, you know, around this, that's exactly what I'd want to do. Oh, most definitely. I mean, if you are able to go and see a practice, you just and really don't understand what's going on. You just think there's a lot of lot of guys out here just running around and really not with a purpose, but Kirby is so organized with his practice. Everyone knows exactly where they're going. They're running to their positions, and it, and it's so fast and so up tempo. Um, and if you don't know where you're going, you're going to hear your name called out over the loudspeaker with with Coach Smart having that mic. So it may look like a uh, it's, I call it organized chaos because everyone knows where they're going. They're moving from one drill to the next in a fast pace, and they know what they're doing. So he's very organized in. in and structurally how he structured his practice he does a great job with that and the thing that I noticed and listen I'm not trying to put myself in the same category of you know people who do this professionally but as someone who's like you know you know runs some like youth league practice things like that they never have people standing around right it's it's not one of those things where like okay one person's doing the drill and like seven people are watching they have like the two spot thing going where like you know you're always a few seconds away from being back in action again and that's the thing that just seems like they've worked very hard to create this situation where no one's standing around during practice. They've even talked about this before of, hey, when you have a lot of depth of your offensive line, that creates a chance to have like four units or, you know, you know, multitudes of units kind of going through these drills and things like that, where when you've got enough bodies in practice, you can create a situation where no one's ever standing around very long. Like everyone's doing football literally the entire time. Oh, most definitely. Everyone is moving. Everyone is getting that work in. Even uh, the the starters to the, the walk-ons. Everyone is, is putting it in the work to get better. So, like I said earlier, it, it looks like organized chaos because if you really don't understand what's going on, you won't get it. But Kirby, uh, before they get out, before the meetings, everyone knows exactly where they're going, and you better do it at a fast pace or you're going to be called out over the loudspeaker. So let me bring you into a conversation I was just having, too, because uh, if a coach like Holgerson says that Georgia's on a level totally separate from everybody else in college football, then to me it sort of stands to reason that Georgia would want to make sure that stays true, not give back any of its advantage and its edge this season. Right now it doesn't have a whole lot of seemingly legitimate competition, so if you could win another national championship, you only kind of create even a larger buffer between yourself and everybody else. And so from that vantage point – Maybe you could say that it's sort of championship or bust for for Georgia this season, as kind of a, as kind of an intense of a statement as that might be. From that vantage point, maybe it's a fair thing to say. So I'll ask you, you know, how would you judge success for Georgia after having won the last two national championships? Is it only a national championship that could be defined as success this season? Typically, I would say no, but maybe Georgia is in kind of a unique category right now. What do you think about that? I think I think winning is is the ultimate goal each year, and that's uh, something that I think that the Georgia Bulldogs going to contend each year. But I just still think it's being able to make the playoffs. Um, I think we 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 will have an opportunity each year to represent the East and go in and and play for an SEC championship. That is that is the first two goals of uh, the East, then winning the SEC championship. If not, you know, trying to win every game to still put yourself in a position make the college playoff. I think it's, it's the college playoff. Uh, I think that is the standard that we have set that we're going to be one of the top four teams and next year it's going to be top 12. And I think the standard will change next year once to go to 12. I, I think Georgia will be a top 12 team year in and year out, but with the, the format the way it is with top four, I think right now it's reaching the top four and let's see what happens when the best four teams get into the playoffs because you never know what can happen. Uh, when the best four teams play. Uh, so I think the, the the goal is not a disappointment to me if we make the playoff. 
and lose that first game. It's not a disappointment because we we put ourselves in position to fight for a national championship. So I would like to win every year, but I I wouldn't be disappointed in making the playoffs and going in and fighting the way we did against Ohio State. Well, I think you bring up a really good point about one thing, which is, you know, you skip ahead a year from now when it's a 12-team playoff. You know, I think that probably creates less parity for college football as opposed to more. I mean, I think when you think about teams like Georgia, you know, these teams that sort of have a talent edge from year to year, it's hard to foresee a scenario when they don't make the playoffs in most years. And you look at the FCS playoffs, as I said many times, like North Dakota State wins that dadgum thing almost every year. And I think you could see a similar situation happen in college football where the very best teams right now, that's Georgia. We'll see what it looks like two years from now. But right now, the very best team is Georgia, that whoever the very best team is, we may see them collect national championships at a rate even higher than we've seen it happen in the recent past, that the expansion of the playoff because it becomes even harder to win, better teams do harder things. We may see the best teams collect even more championships in the future, I believe. I think so. I mean, just there's going to be 12 teams. And I think, in my personal opinion, uh, you're probably going to see the same eight teams every year, and you might have different four, but there's going to be the same eight teams every year, Georgia, you know, Alabama, uh, probably Clemson, Ohio State. You're going to see the same eight teams in the playoffs every year. And there's probably going to be some mix mix and matches with the other four. But like you said, there's not going to be in the parity around the the same. It's going to be the same teams year in and year out fighting for the title. We joked about this yesterday that, you know, you got Reese Davis, Kirk Kripke, some of those big names from ESPN. They have picked teams other than Georgia to win this year's national championship, or at least strongly suggesting that someone else other than Georgia win the national championship. And then they sort of laugh sarcastically at Georgia fans who – want to call them out for it like like what do you make of the idea and I'll put myself in this category but some other Georgia fans are in that category too that Georgia is sort of once again perceived to have some doubters and once again have some skeptics despite the fact they've won the last two national championships Terrence I've jokingly said that it's easier for Georgia to win the national championship seemingly than it is for Georgia to be picked to win the national championship here during the preseason by some of the most prominent voices around the sport. Like, how real do you think that conversation is? I, I, I honestly don't think it's real. I think it's more talking points. I honestly think those guys uh, kind of just go out on a limb and say something like, it's easy to pick Georgia to win because we do have the best roster, we do have the best coach, we do have probably the best – uh, recruiting team going on right now. So let's just talk about some other teams to try to make the, the season interesting. I think if you talk about the same team every day, it probably get disinterested and your show will probably get stale. So let's let's talk about other teams outside probably the team that's probably is going to be picked to win by everyone. So I, I, I just think it's for show purposes. I personally believe um, if you put them on a lot of chapter tests that Georgia is probably the favorite to win it. Uh, but let's let's not bring our show to we talking about Georgia. There's a lot of other fan bases that like to that watches our show and our rating has to stay up. Real quick, final question for you. In a couple of minutes, we're going to have the former Georgia coach Mark Richt on the show. Obviously, one of the coaches you had while you were at Georgia, Terrence. What does Coach Rick mean to you? Everything, everything to me. I just had a, a spirited debate with one of my best friends, Justin Miller, who uh, was the Clemson All American DB and coaches with me at Milton, we have these spirits to debate because that's what we do. He just said, man, Coach Rick can't do no wrong for you right now. Nope, he can't. <laughs> he can't. So, you know, that guy means so much to me, man. He's done so much to me in my life. And I understand. He said, well, what, where's, where's Coach Rick on the, on the totem pole? And I'm, and I'm real. I still I think Kirby is going to be the best coach we ever had. Vince doing number two. And I'm put Kirby at, I'm going to put Coach Rick at three. I understand the shortcomings that we had. And we didn't win. I was a player. I was, I was part of one of those shortcomings against Florida. But the man, you know, he, he's just not a football coach. And he's done so much for so many people. And I tell people, you know, there's no Terrence that was all-time leading receiver without Mark Rick coming into my life. So I owe him, and I'm, I'm indebted to him. And, and uh, I love that even today I could call him right now and he answers the phone. So that man, I owe a lot to that, that man. Boy, Terrence, that's really well said. I know you got a lot going on right now, so we'll let you get back to it. Uh, obviously, Milton getting ready for a great season. That's the staff that you're on, but you also got the Terrence Edwards Wide Receiver Academy there, too. People want to follow you and see what you got going on there as well. So tell folks how they can find you on social media. 
Uh, if you heard a big crowd, that's the Milton offensive lineman coming from the weight room going to the field. So I'm at, at Milton now. They're making all these noise. But uh, if anyone is looking, especially middle school, because I, I am having middle school sessions from 1030 to 1130 every day. So nice. if any of the middle school kids looking to get better at their craft, you can find me on all social media platforms at Terrence Edwards Wide Receiver Academy. Boy, that's good stuff, Terrence. Thanks for being here today. Enjoy it. We'll look forward to talking to you soon, all right? Thank you. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. Yeah, I love it, man. Real deal practices starting around Georgia here right now. My buddy Rusty Manziel and I getting ready to do Corky Kell Classic action. You're coming up soon. Uh, Matt Stewart, a part of that. So many others. Our friend Kaylee Manziel going to be on those broadcasts there as well. We are here. We are in it. You know, high school football starts a good bit earlier than, than college football does. And so, you know, for those of us who like the high school game, I'm lucky enough to be a part of a lot of great high school broadcasts like you know that stuff is here you know we're not waiting on that there's no waiting left it's here it's here it's going on and uh, great places like milton the program that terrence involved with uh, talk about mark rick uh, his son john you know a part of that prince avenue staff there i was talking to john a little bit this week they're they're rocking and rolling they're getting ready i just love it i, I just love the energy around all of this and people dedicating their lives to making their teams as good as they can possibly be that's what makes the state so competitive and man, what a great season this I mean, y'all, the season is just going to be amazing. We're actually talking about a uh, in-state guy here in a minute that kind of contributes to some of that. Cannot wait for an extraordinary season around Georgia high school football, and the preparations for that are ongoing. This isn't the, you know, sort of look way ahead in the future type stuff anymore. No, this is happening. Like these teams are these teams are getting ready for the season here right now. Practice is taking place all across our great state. And Terrence Edwards, obviously a big part of that. Let's get ready to go cruise around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean. We'll talk to Mark Rick, speaking of that, about seven minutes from right now. And it gives me a chance to remind you there are great things happening with our friends at Royal Caribbean right now, too, including, as you're watching on video, you see Icon of the Seas. That's a big ship debuting January of 2024. It'll be the largest ship ever constructed. It's finished. It's essentially ready to sail, and it's going to be uh, on and popping come january here so if you talk to our friend jessica slater she can tell you all about it 770-718-9147 that's 770-718-9147 she can also tell you about utopia of the seas another really cool uh new introduction from royal caribbean a brand new oasis class ship that's also going to debut uh next year too that's going to be in the summertime going out of port canaveral three and four night sailings on one of those oasis class ships unlike anything that's ever been offered in the cruise industry before Royal Caribbean going to make that happen for you. And don't forget, when you think about Oasis-class ships, it's also a reminder of the Dog Nation cruise in 2024. Going to be bigger and better than ever before. The stuff you love, like going to Perfect Day, Coco Cay, we're still doing that. The stuff that you want more of, like great experiences on board, that is when an Oasis-class ship like Allure of the Seas, the one that we'll be on, Allure of the Seas, provides you. We're leaving out of Port Canaveral. We're going to Nassau in the Bahamas, going to Perfect Day, Coco Cay, even more fun dog nation special events and some of these are going to be really really cool i can't tell you about those yet but it's going to be a great experience we've sold state rooms by the bushels already right now each and every day we're selling more and more so it's not too soon to start thinking about this in fact you need to think about this now before the opportunity goes away because we've been told in no uncertain terms that once our state room reservations are gone we can't get more so royaldogs.com is the website that jessica slater has put together royaldogs.com you can find out information about the dog nation cruise in 2024 on board allure of the seas and jessica can tell you as well but all the other great things that royal caribbean's got going on here right now so let's give you a couple of recruiting updates here for a moment <laughs> i'll be honest with you i thought we might be heading towards commitment time for nate frazier the terrific uh, running back <laughs> instead frazier yesterday dropped his top eight so I was sort of thinking we were whittling things down and narrowing them down a little bit more than that with Frazier. But I can promise you this, he is a prospect worth waiting on. Nice graphic here from On3 if you're watching on video. You see Alabama and Georgia. That might be the crux of this battle here for a moment. Oregon, Miami, Texas A&M, Auburn, uh, Nebraska, and Tennessee. That's the final eight for Frazier right now. I think Frazier's a big-time athlete. And I think if you bring in a Frazier to go along, like I say, a Dwight Phillips that Georgia already has – you know, some of the stuff they've done to wide receiver position too. Y'all, this team in the future can be really, really athletic. And, you know, a, a guy like Frazier has the ability to make people miss both as kind of a traditional running back, but also out of the passing game there as well. I honestly don't know how you defend that. And there's an aspect of football that gets really, really simple, really, really fast, like the complicated X and O's and, 
and sort of schematic type conversations that can sort of seem like rocket science at times. That stuff gets really, really simple really, really fast when guys like Frazier had the football in their hand. They're just simply making would-be tacklers miss. This is a this is a recruitment worth watching here. It seems like Georgia's in a pretty good spot. We're obviously following it closely. It's a name I want to ask Jeff Sintel about when he joins us on Friday. You see a top eight drop there, and you see Georgia right in the middle of all of that. Speaking of top eights, we also got one of those for Julian Juju Lewis yesterday. This is the rising sophomore quarterback at Carrollton. And a lot of you, you know, if, if you're a part of our show, the odds are you're probably not like sort of mainstreamish, you know, type fan. We're a fairly mainstream show, I guess. But uh, but a lot of our content is sort of geared towards people who are like sort of as obsessed with college football as we are. So many of you already know a good bit about Lewis, the rising sophomore at Carrollton. I would say that the rest of the public is only about to find this out. My guess is over the course of these next few months, Lewis is about to come, become very, very famous. He had a terrific freshman season. He got Carrollton in the 7A classification of the state final. That is not an easy thing to do. And he played really, really well and at times had some massive performances to help get the Trojans there to that spot. He's about to be as famous at, in the state of Georgia as a Trevor Lawrence would have been, as a Justin Fields would have been. This is the level of prospect he's about to be, if not even higher than that. This is going to be one of the most talked about recruitments in the history of our state. I don't say that lightly. And so he drops the top eight yesterday. George is a part of this. I think there are a lot of teams that are going to be a factor in the Lewis recruitment. But more, more than anything, this is just sort of one of those statements about the fact that the Juju Lewis, that's his nickname, Juju, the Juju Lewis recruitment hysteria is kind of only just now building but my, oh, my, is it really on the way? A couple more other stories I'll get to you real quickly. There was a weird dust-up yesterday that disappeared almost as fast as it started involving the possibility that Ed Orgeron might be in line to be the next Northwestern coach. Obviously, Northwestern's been in the news for all the wrong reasons as of late. Uh, Pat Fitzgerald lost his job. Their question still being asked about exactly what might have gone on and exactly what Fitzgerald involvement all that might have been. But putting that aside... Uh, obviously Northwestern's an opening in the Big Ten, and that's gonna, we said it's going to get some interest. And uh, there had been this rumor and this chatter that Ed Orgeron was one of the guys apparently interested in the job. Well, I believe it's Bruce Feldman from The Athletic who kind of became the first prominent voice to shut this down, that Orgeron apparently not interested in being the coach at Northwestern. I can't imagine a worse fit. Now, I think that Orgeron will probably coach again, I think. And as I said before, I do believe the Northwestern job is going to be kind of attractive to some you know good number of candidates. But given what Northwestern is, given who Ed Orgeron is, <laughs> this would have been such an odd fit. I think it's one of the reasons why so many people on the internet yesterday were rooting for this, just because of how strange the whole uh, thing was there. So uh, interesting there. Orgeron rumors popped up yesterday, apparently not true. And I'll finish by giving a couple of recruiting notes here for a moment. So both Florida and Alabama have picked up pretty big commits here in the last couple of days. Fletcher Westfall, uh, offensive lineman at one point in time, we would kind of talked about it in the Georgia program, Westfall going to Florida. That happened, I think, two days ago now, or maybe it was yesterday. Uh, and then Casey Poe, as expected, did commit to Alabama. There have been a lot of questions asked as of late about exactly what is going on with Alabama football recruiting. Is this just a slow start? or Because they're obviously they're ranked inside the top 25, but not near the top the way we've come to expect them to be. Is this just a slow start, or is there some sort of you know evidence of loss of momentum for Alabama recruiting? I think for now, we're kind of content to assume that when it's all said and done, they probably put a class together that's pretty similar to what we're used to seeing them get. And the official commitment of Poe yesterday may be some evidence of that. That's another player that we've kind of talked about in this show, kind of around Georgia circles here a little bit. Uh, a really good kind of interior offensive lineman, Poe committing to Alabama yesterday. So we'll give you those two recruiting notes, and we will make that cruising around the SEC, courtesy of Royal Caribbean. And now here on Dog Nation Daily, as promised, I want to bring on a guest that we're thrilled to have on the show today, the uh, terrific former Georgia coach Mark Richt uh, here today. He's got a big event he's going to be a part of there at the uh, D1 training facility coming up in a couple of Saturdays. We'll tell you about that before we're done with our conversation today. But prior to that, Coach, let me welcome you to the show and say thank you for your time, and we appreciate you being here today. I'm glad to be here with you. Thank you. 
So uh, just a moment ago, we had one of your former players, Terrence Edwards, in the show, and I asked him directly because we knew we were going to have you on what you meant to him. And uh, 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 Terrence told us, he said, you know, Coach Rick means everything. In fact, he says, that's a guy that can do no wrong in my book. And obviously, uh, Coach Rick, that's not the only former player of yours that would certainly speak that way about you. You had a very successful career, and we'll talk about you know you know some of those accolades here in a moment. But maybe no better testament to to what you were as a coach the fact that so many of your former players would step up and speak about you that way. What does that mean to you when you still have that bond all these years later with guys like that that you that you coach with right. that you competed alongside? What does that mean to you? Well, it feels good, and it also helps me realize they don't know me very good. <laughs> uh, but, uh, no, I think the biggest thing with the former players, even when I left Georgia and went to Miami, I kept my phone number from Georgia. I didn't, I didn't, want, to, I didn't want to lose contact with all those players. Fifteen years of players and coaches and just relationships, you know. And uh, I just uh, – I think the biggest thing is the guys understood that there was no shortcut to victory. We were going to work hard as a team, but they also knew I cared about them beyond the game of football uh, and wanted them to be successful in life down the road because there's so many guys that go through the process of having their lives kind of mapped out for them through sports and even a little pro ball, some of them. Yeah. But sooner or later that ends, and then, it, then it's kind of like, now what? And I just had too many guys over the years that would call or come to my office and say, Coach, I don't know where to go from here. And uh, so we just try to really do a good job of preparing for the future. And the other thing, too, is in recruiting, you know, there, there were a lot of guys that came from, you know, homes that didn't have a father figure. A lot of moms came to me and said, I can I can teach my son a lot of things, but I can't teach him how to be a man. Can, hmm. can you help me do that? So I took that as seriously as I could, and our staff did, and, I think most coaches do. Don't get me wrong. Sure. But the guys know. Uh, the guys know we love them. Recently, we were all thrilled. You know, go back to the beginning of the year when it was announced you'd be going to the College Football Hall of Fame, and you know, to have your career recognized like that, the success that you enjoyed. Uh, what did that mean for you to kind of be recognized that way? I mean, I think of you as a humble person, but at the same time, I mean, people would want that kind of status. It's such a you know a rare accomplishment. What did it mean to you to kind of earn that berth into the College Football Hall of Fame? Right. <clears throat> well, it meant a lot to us. And I say us, Catherine and I, my wife, you know, we've, we're in this thing together, and uh, any great coach knows that uh, without, a, without a great coach's wife, it, he ain't going to make it. Right. There's <clears throat> many times in my career that she picked me up when I was at my lowest, and uh, – I never could have accomplished much much of anything good without her. So, but uh, we, you know, when we got the uh, the information through the mail, mm-hmm. uh, they, they sent a football and it was really nicely decorated, obviously. But it said it kind of said "Welcome to the club." Wow! And uh, we just we embraced and hugged and kissed and, and smiled and laughed and celebrated. And then when you think about that legacy of success, you know, it's still really evident around the Georgia program here right now. And I think it's really cool for those of us that have great memories of a 2002 SEC championship and a 2005 SEC championship and the fun things that happened 2007, 2012. We can cite a lot of these, you know, really cool moments. The fact that so many of the guys who were kind of alongside you for some of that are still at Georgia here right now. You know, Mike Bobo is the Georgia offensive coordinator. Stacey Sarles is back as offensive line coach. Brian McClendon, of course, is the wide receivers coach, and we could go on and on with that. What is it like for you to know that that guys that you were a part of, in some cases mentoring in their early days as coaches, or in some cases just kind of, you know, working with, that they're kind of now either back at Georgia and that so much of, I guess, your fingerprint on Georgia is kind of still remaining with the program here right now? Well, I mean, those guys are just quality people, quality coaches. and I think Todd Hartley's still there, too. That's right. But, uh, wonderful tight ends coach. But, um, you know, and and actually at one time, uh, you know, I had hired Kirby uh, to, to work with us. We, we knew he was a great defensive coach, but we just tried to get him on staff, period. And we had a running backs coach position open and brought him in as running backs, knowing that if something opened up on defense, he'd be first in line. But uh, then he ended up, I think, the very next year going with Coach Saban at May with the Dolphins. But, you know, so we, we definitely uh, had a lot of 
uh, history with those guys. And, uh, you know, every one of those guys are really, really good at what they do. Uh, they're great recruiters, great coaches, and the kind of guys that, you know, I think most parents would want their sons to be under. So it's not a shock to me to see these guys having that kind of success. And I'm, I'm rooting for them in a big way. In the case of Bo uh, Coach Bobo in particular, now back as offensive coordinator, that's a job at one point in time you would have had at Florida State prior to becoming uh, Georgia head coach. And I think a lot of people are kind of curious of, okay, what might we see from Coach Bobo? And I guess my specific question for you is, you know, this is a guy who, you know, had his time calling plays at Georgia back when you were head coach. He's also kind of moved right. around since then and worked with uh, a Todd Monk in a year ago. As a coach, how much of, of – I guess, other ideas and other concepts do you collect over the course of that time? And how right. much of a combination of all of that do you think that Coach Bobo right. might put on display as play caller for Georgia here this year? Right. Well, you, you nailed it on the head. You know, things keep evolving. Things keep changing. And there's new ideas and people, uh, you know, when it, I think the key is when you see a good idea, you recognize it and you, and you implement it. And but it's one thing to put in something systematically, and it's another thing to really teach it. Because you can have great strategy, but if your tactics aren't very good, if your fundamentals aren't very good, then it's going to be tough to be, you know, successful on any side of the ball. But, you know, so I think that, uh, you know, Mike has been, you know, here's one thing about Mike. Philosophically, he's old school as far as mental and physical toughness, and you have to have that. The Southeastern Conference, you need it on the field. You need it in recruiting. You need to know what it takes to get the job done in the league. And Mike gets that. And that's one of the things I really enjoyed about him the most. You mentioned a moment ago that you had Kirby Smart on your staff as running backs coach back in 2005. You've known him since he was obviously a pretty young, uh, in, in kind of a rookie -ish, you know, type coach. What's it like for you then to see the success that uh, Georgia's enjoyed these last two years, winning these national championships? Coach Smart's told stories about some text messages y'all have exchange, exchanged prior to a championship sure. game. We know how much you've been rooting for these dogs. What has it been like for you to watch the success that the UGA has enjoyed here? Right. Well, the biggest thing for me, the most fun for me, I guess, was being able to be in Indianapolis when Georgia – won the first one yeah. in a long time. Not the first one ever, but it felt like the first one. And uh, I got to enjoy it with my two older sons, John and David. We got a chance to do a you know, men's town trip, so to speak. But uh, to actually watch the fan base, to be in the stands, and to see the reaction of the fans uh, you know, after that big interception and knowing the game was in hand, it just was. Uh, it was fun to watch everybody's emotion, and uh, I was a big. I was right in the middle of them. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's so exciting. So I want to tell folks about a big event taking place. It's two Saturdays from now. It's Saturday, July 29th at the D1 training facility that John Rick, uh, Coach Rick's son, has been doing such a great job with, and obviously some really cool things there. Uh, and it's going to be a big-time autograph signing. Obviously, Coach Rick going to be a part of that. We also have a number of other former Georgia players confirmed for this event there as well. Our buddy John Stinchcomb going to be on hand. Tim Worley, the terrific former running back. Bakari Rambo going to be there as well. And if you want to purchase tickets to be a part of this, there's a website you can go to. You can essentially search CA Autographs at eventbrite.com and find out how to be a part of the big Mark Richt autograph signing and all of the other legendary former players who are going to be on hand at the D1 training facility there in Athens. It's from 3 to 5 p.m., on July 29th, Coach Rick, uh, other former Georgia players. There's also going to be a really cool uh, bulldog there. You can get your picture taken with a, with a great-looking uh, dog and so many other family-friendly uh, opportunities. A, a bulldog really looks just like Uga. You can kind of get some pictures uh, taken there with that. And, and so many fun things going to be going on there at the D1 training facility on July 29th from 3 to 5 p.m., uh, going to be a great time to, to get an autograph from Coach Rick and get an autograph from other folks there as well. So eventbrite.com, CA Autographs, uh, getting that done for you. And, and, Coach, I'll ask you about that. First of all, it seems like the D1 training facility is a great place. I know you've even been doing some work there yourself as you uh, continue to courageously battle Parkinson's disease, but it sounds like a lot of folks there in the Athens area have really you know, kind of used this facility and are, are you know getting better and training there. It right. seems like it's been a real success story, and I know a lot of folks are be excited about right. seeing that coming up on July. July 29th. 
Right. Well, and it's called D one because it, 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 it it's uh, Division one training. Basically, it's it's kind of team training. It's really outstanding. And not only is John running the, running the show, but uh, Fred Munsonmeyer, another former yeah. player of mine, are partners with us, uh, business partners with this endeavor. And and as you mentioned, uh, uh, a lot of uh, success. It's a great facility. There's great coaching going on. And I am doing a little bit of a rock steady boxing <laughs> for Parkinson's Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. So I'm getting some use out of it too. But, you know, the event's going to be great, family friendly for sure. I just want people to understand that if they do have to get tickets in advance, if they show up and it's sold out, I, I'd hate for to have to turn somebody away. So, I understand. Yeah, we need to see, they just need to get on the website to make sure they get their tickets in advance. Yeah, so it's CA Autographs there at eventbrite.com, and we'll make sure that folks get a link to this. When we put the show out, we'll put the uh, link out there and all of that. People can see that. And I guess, Coach, before we let you go, if you don't mind us asking, you know, how are you feeling here these days? I hope that you get the sense of how many people around Dog Nation are truly, sincerely, genuinely praying for you on a very regular basis. And uh, we're obviously, you know, uh, (laughs) cheering every time we hear, you know, a a good update on you. So uh, how are you feeling these days, Coach? I'm feeling good, and, and I do uh, feel the love and the prayers of everybody. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, it's great to be able to be in Athens and uh, and and still have a great relationship with everybody. So we're thankful for that. And uh, I, I'm feeling, I feel good. You know, I don't I don't have any pain issues. My biggest symptoms are slow movement, balance. Even get my muscles get rigid sometimes, and all. But I'm not. I'm not in chronic pain. My brain still works pretty good. You can tell my voice is failing just a little bit at times, but for the most part, I'm doing good. And with our three grandchildren living down the street from us, uh, we're in grandparent heaven, so (laughs) we're, we're doing good. Well, Coach, that's a great thing to hear. We really appreciate your time here today. We're looking forward to seeing you there on July 29th at the D1 Training Facility. I know a lot of Georgia fans are excited about getting those tickets and being a part of that event there themselves. So thank you for being here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Meriwether and Tharp today. And, Coach, we'll look forward to seeing you there. Have a great day. Thank you. Good stuff there from the terrific former Georgia coach, Mark Richt. And uh, to give you another reminder, as he said, if you want to be a part of the autograph signing that he's going to be there for and the other Georgia former Georgia players themselves, that is an event you have to get tickets for in advance. So you can either go to eventbrite.com and search CA Autographs to find out more about that, or you can go to ca-autographs.com. That's ca-autographs.com. Boy, so, so good to hear Coach Rick. Uh Obviously, a man that so many of us have been inspired by over the years, and we have celebrated and enjoyed, and we're glad to see the College Ball Hall of Fame has recognized the success there. Glad to see that uh, his uh, fingerprint still on the Georgia for, uh, program in such a big way. Uh, proud to have you know guys like Coach Hartley and Coach McClendon, and you know on and on you want to go with uh, guys who are a part of his staff now back there at Georgia again. Really, really, really. A terrific interview to have as a part of our program today, and I'm so happy we were able to do that. Let me give you a quick shout-out one more time before we get ready to go today. Don't forget, it is a great, great time right now to be outside, enjoy the kind of the summer grilling season. I just love that. I'm one of those guys, you can probably tell, I mean (laughs) – you know, I probably get a little too much sun from time to time, but I like to be outside uh, during the summertime of year. I like to go to the pool, like to have the cookouts, like to get out there and do all that kind of stuff, play golf, go fishing, whatever else. And that is what Kroger is all about there too, especially when it comes to getting on the grill, cooking up some good stuff and being a part of all that kind of stuff. So you've got any kind of big thing going on here, you know, you cut out the hot dogs, the ribs, the steaks, all that kind of stuff. Uh, all the stuff that goes along with that there as well. Make sure you check out your Kroger, uh, local Kroger, for a lot more on that because you can get great savings, you've got high quality, all the stuff that makes the summertime fun. Get it right there at your local Kroger, or you can see them online to begin with, Kroger.com, for a lot more on that. And, of course, I know you'll look forward to doing that as we head towards the weekend. Speaking of uh, terrific sponsors, that's what our golden shoes sort of themed around here right now. Our buddy Frankie Fibonacci sent this to me. I thought this was funny. So obviously we've been thrilled to have our friends at Dr. Pepper as a part of Around the Doghouse. And uh, you've seen the Dr. Pepper commercials with Little Sweet. I don't know. They, they still did a Little Sweet commercial. I'm not quite so sure. 
but he put a little sweet on the uh, on the screen here and kind of laughing about the idea that we had the golden shoe yesterday of the very tiny Florida defensive line competing against the uh, gigantic Georgia offensive line. That was sort of a funny graphic that somebody made. And, uh, you know, the idea of being uh, very, very little, like little sweet was in those commercials. Maybe that is a future uh, Florida defensive line there as well. So funny by Frankie Fibonacci. We'll give him a golden shoe for that. Speaking of the lousy, stinking Gators, they may be bigger than some of the teams they play. They will not be bigger than Georgia. They will definitely not be better 107 days from right now. That is our Gator Hater Countdown. We'll see all of you back here tomorrow at Dog Nation Daily, presented by Merriweather and Tharp. And on video, time now for our R.S. Andrews Cooldown. R.S. Andrews, the one you turn to for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, and electric needs. Showing up on time, doing the work that's promised for the price that's promised. That is what our friends at uh, R.S. Andrews are all about. Hope you enjoyed Coach Rick right there. I certainly did. A real thrill to have him as a part of the show and just uh, um, a guy that we're just very proud of his influence over Georgia football and particularly, you know, I used the word inspired before. I mean, I think that Coach Rick's one of those guys that has inspired me for a long time. And, you know, I didn't quite get into this with the interview with him, but he gave a quote at one point in time that sort of everybody knows that part of the Rick story, right? Everybody kind of knows the, oh, this is a good man, a good man that's made other men better, which is maybe uh, the highest compliment you can ever give anybody. Uh, everybody kind of knows that part of it. But I think at one point in time, Coach Rick had sort of said about the College Football Hall of Fame thing that it's also an acknowledgement of like sort of the prime directive, the main objective of a football coach to win games. The Coach Rick did plenty of that too. Two SEC championships, as many seasons of the top 10 as Coach Rick had. Uh, certainly nothing to, to to shy away from. Had there been a college football playoff, as we've said many times, during the Rick era, Georgia would have probably been in several of those playoffs, probably should have played for the BCS title in 2007, but that is water under the bridge. Uh, the point is, it was a great career, but it was a great career that kind of coincided with just a really distinguished level of behavior. And that's one of those things that, I promise I'll get off my soapbox after this, we'll start taking comments. It's one of those things where, like, you know, in life, like, a lot of things, you know, you don't really have a whole lot of control over the hand that you're dealt. You really don't um, in a number of ways, professionally or health-wise, personally, whatever else. The only choice you have is is how you respond to all of that. And uh, Coach Rick is a blueprint for how all of us should respond, I think. And, gosh, I know I hope that I can, you know, be as poised and as, uh, I don't know, just, just dignified as Coach Richt has been through everything that he's uh, gone through in his life there. Just really, really a uh, fun conversation to have on the show. I was late starting our first and 15 today at dognation.com, so I told our dognation.com viewers that we would start with them for our first and uh, for our R.S. Andrews school done today. So we will do that here right now. George Ann Olive says that Mark Richt is someone that you, Jake, can always be proud of. That is indeed true. Jacob Yarbrough said, I had the pleasure of getting to hear Mark Rick speak at an uh, event called Man to Man Conference at my home church in Augusta, Georgia, and it was an awesome experience. Such a man of faith, and it was great to hear how he truly lived that lifestyle every coaching stop he's made. Yeah, I mean, this is the real deal when it comes to stuff like that. And there's also, you know, if you want to go back and read about this, you know, sort of go back to Coach Rick's time prior to coming to Florida State. That's not really what Mark Rick was, and he does not shy away from that. You know, he had a true, legitimate, authentic conversion experience. I'm going to you know, talk about you know, that kind of stuff necessarily on, on the show all the time we're focused on football but you know you know rick rick stories about you know when he was in miami he was doing things a lot of college students do he sort of been very open about that and you know it, it's at florida state where he kind of made some decisions to to change his life and um and obviously that's the version of him we know right now uh matt rugavina says that uh in 2002 and 2012 we were probably the best team in the country I would add to that uh, Matt 2007 that's the one for me where by the end of that year I truly don't know that anyone could have competed with Georgia uh they were just playing at a different level and it's kind of a shame that that year's Sugar Bowl against Hawaii it's not the kind of opponent that could have validated how good Georgia was Georgia kind of got stuck playing a team that didn't really provide much in the way of winning when you look at the way that I mean you know, this is a, a time which, you know, Florida's pretty good. Uh, this is the Tim Tebow era at Florida and, and, and Georgia, you know, make a big deal about celebration, things like that. But, you know, Georgia won the game at a time which that's a pretty big deal. And, you know, the game against Auburn, people think of it as the blackout. But, you know, Georgia put an impressive performance together there at that time that 
that this is a team that sort of found a spark second half of that season. And I think by the end of the year, they're playing as well as anybody. Admittedly, they would like to have had the Tennessee and the South Carolina games back from earlier in the season. They played you know, pretty bad on the road at uh, Tennessee for sure. Had a rough offensive game uh, to begin the, that season in 2000, you know, against South Carolina. But, you know, when you look at all the crazy things that happened there that year, I think a lot of Georgia fans thought when West Virginia lost, some of those things that kind of played out on that final night of the regular season, that Georgia was just sort of destined to move up. And, you know, that's when I think a lot of Georgia fans got pretty frustrated with ESPN because ESPN got real aggressive real fast about kind of casting a narrative that Georgia didn't deserve it because they didn't win their division. And, you know, back then we were in the era of the BCS and so many of the polls, I mean, that was the, you know, you could – you had a lot of like sort of packing peanut window dressing stuff with the uh, computers, but that was really about the polls. You know, two thirds of the formula for the BCS was the AP and the coaches poll. And once ESPN kind of cast the narrative of Georgia doesn't deserve it, the coaches and the writers who vote, they kind of fell in line with that narrative. And I do think that Georgia, you know, you know, really lost its chance to play for the national championship. If I had been college football king or czar back in 2007, I would have put I would have pitted Georgia against LSU for the national championship. Well, you can't have two SEC teams playing for the title. Well, you know, four years later we did point Alabama and LSU. We've seen that happen a couple of times since then there as well. Uh, I think that Georgia was, I think, unfairly treated um, at that time. Randy Hall wondering if Eddie's going to get any new outfits this year. Yeah, I don't know. It's always kind of tricky uh, finding, first of all, clothes that fit the, uh, the squirrel. But also there's a certain sense in which, you know, you don't want to kind of tarnish the brand too much. Eddie sort of is what he is. There could be some fun things coming down the pipe for Eddie here in the very near future, though. We shall see about that. Um, let's see what else. Uh, Dog Daddy's got a prediction that not only will Georgia win a third straight national championship, they're going to go four in a row there as well. So that is a big time stuff. Um, uh, Cam Hasty thinking back to the time in which uh, uh, Coach Bowden, uh, you know, did have such an impact on uh, Coach Rick's faith, and you know, there's some good stuff out there. And I remember watching this in like some sort of documentary or something one time. I, I, was it a thirty for thirty that sort of covered this? Uh, it's really, it's really fascinating. Uh, I wasn't aware of a lot of this. Um, I guess it all kind of comes after the death of Pablo Lopez, which is not a story that I was super familiar with, but. Um, but it's a very, very interesting story to, to, to go back and, and reconsider. Doggy, thanks for the kind words. Appreciate that. Uh, Matt Rukavina also enjoying a little, a little bit of the little sweet stuff. All right, so uh, let me go to uh, YouTube here for a moment, and we'll get some comments there. And I hope you're all doing well today. Uh... Let us see what else. Uh, Foster Moss says, uh, Brock Bauer saying he got drug tested after the 21 national title game. Did you know about that? I guess they do the random stuff, right? And when I say random, it's random. Uh, you know who told some stories about that is Dave Pollock. Like, uh, like they're not they're – the, uh, the NCAA does some of this. The NFL does it more, even more aggressive. They don't play around stuff like that. That is <laughs> – not to get too graphic, but that is – like the these drug tests are also invasive. They are invasive. Um, I'm not quite so sure I'd feel about some of that. Uh, all right, uh, our producer Michael Carvel is throwing this up here. What he calls the weirdest fits in college football: Ed Orgeron at Northwestern being compared to like Steve Spurrier or Duke. You want to go back to late '80s when Spurrier was there? Yeah, maybe so. Les Miles at Kansas—that's a pretty weird. Although Les Miles is kind of a Midwestern type guy, Kansas is more of a plain state, but you kind of had some of that. Ron Zook at Florida, Lou Holtz at South Carolina, Bear Bryant at Kentucky. Brian Harson, uh, Brian Harson at Auburn may be the biggest of them all because this is one of those where Harson was a bad fit there from the word go. I mean, from the word go, he didn't fit. He also had the issue with the fact that the boosters that didn't want him reveled in every misstep that he had because it proved they were right. Um, so Harson had a lot working against him just to begin with. Um, but you may be hard pressed to find an example of a guy who was a who was a worse fit for this school in the SEC than Brian Harson was, and you kind of want to blame Brian Harson for that, or you sort of want to blame Auburn for hiring him, and I get why you would. But y'all, this was one of the winningest Group of Five coaches that was out there. The thing that I always think kind of gets under discussed in some of this kind of stuff is if you are 
a very successful coach. He was winning seventy something percent of his games. You know, you know, knocking on the door of eighty percent of his games. You know, at Boise State. If that doesn't in any way prepare you for the SEC, like if that doesn't even get you to a zero in terms of your readiness to compete as a head coach in the SEC, then the rest of college football's got a huge problem. I mean, it, it just really does. And Auburn should have known better. You know, maybe Brian Harson should have had enough humility to to not accept the job. But listen, if you offer me the Auburn head coaching job at the, to the tune of millions of dollars, I'd probably take it. I'm not qualified for the job, but that ain't my problem. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna collect that. I'm gonna collect that money. I'm gonna collect that paycheck. So. Ultimately, a guy like Arson's like, if you offer me the job, I'm going to take it. That's where, like, is it the Peter principle? Is that where that comes from? That people eventually rise to their level of incompetence? Um, if you offer me that job, you better believe most people are going to take it. So, you know, some of this kind of comes down to how is the group of five, how is a, you know, higher level group of five team like Boise State, how is that not preparing a coach for the grind of the SEC any better than that? I think there's some of that that has to be done. William Perry said the coach Rick would be a great regular guest. William, that would be a nice thing. Um, uh, that, w- that would be a very nice thing. Maybe that can be the start um, uh, of something in the future. <laughs> uh, Christy says that Auburn dialed the wrong number off of the wrong coach. That's uh, really funny, Christy. Really funny. Uh, G. Grace Mamma Boy says that uh, 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 Foster needs to be drug tested for some of his crazy takes. Wasn't it back in the nineties? Didn't Jim Rome have something like that where like it's a drug test? Or you could get like a drug test. <laughs> like you could basically like challenge someone's bad takes. Uh pretty funny. Pretty funny. Um uh Nature Gator and the subject of Will Muschamp being at Florida. Uh let us see what else. Paul Moon says that he loves Muschamp, but he's got a long way to go before he's ready to be the CEO type. So this is one of those things where, like, I do genuinely believe, and I think I said this the other day, I think a lot of what, like, a lot of what messed Muschamp up, I believe, was largely just bad luck, right? I mean, it's like, um, like, at Florida, they had the one big-time quarterback committee. It just turned out not to be very good, I guess. Um, didn't stay there very long. I don't I don't even really remember. Um yeah, Driscoll, Jeff Driscoll, that's right. He's a pretty big recruit, right? Uh, it just turned out not to be very good. Like, if that guy's good, then maybe a lot of things a lot, a lot of things are different. And obviously, you know, Muschamp had a lot of offensive coordinator hires that didn't quite work out. But, you know, I would say that hiring offensive coordinator is actually a pretty hard thing to do. Um, it's like if – let's say that, you know, we get our EA Sports video game team or something like that, and we have real coaches, whatever else. If we're creating a sort of our fictitious team, and I said, "Hey, I need a head coach," we would all be able to come up with a pretty good list of. We'll go try to hire this coach and hire that coach. If the money's right; you're able to get this guy. It doesn't take a lot of creativity to, um, you know, to have a pretty good list of head coaches. I'd say defensive coordinators kind of the same way that if we had, you know, if we had to create a team today that needed a defensive coordinator, there are enough kind of lifers on that side of the ball. You could probably find somebody you felt okay about. But y'all, I mean, Arizona State hired, uh, you know, uh, what's his name from Oregon to be its head coach like this year. Why am I blank? I'm getting terrible with names. The guy who was at Oregon as offensive coordinator a year ago is head coach at Arizona State. Now he's like, he's he's very, very young, very young. But these offensive-minded head coaches become, you know, I should say these offensive-minded coaches become head coaches so quick. The pool of talent from who you can hire as an offensive coordinator is just not not very big. It's just not very big. Um, you know, a lot of these youngish offensive mind become head coaches really, really quickly. Somebody surely is telling me what, what is the Arizona State's coach name? The guy that came from Auburn. I mean, came from Oregon. Uh, what is that guy's name? Um, uh, somebody will tell me in a minute. Um, uh, but the point is, is like these coordinators just get hired really fast. So, you know, some of the issue will must champ didn't hire good offensive coordinators. Maybe he should have vetted the guys he hired better. But there's also no, yeah, Kenny Dillingham. Thank you, Kurt, or, or, uh, Curtis. Thank you, Kenny Dillingham. That's a young guy. He's head coach at Arizona State now. Arizona State, you know, way out west, you know, on the other side of the Colorado River. That's a pretty good job. You know, there's you know there's decent access to talent. Uh, that's one of the, I would say, better jobs out west. That's a pretty good job, and they hired a very young offensive-minded coach. 
And that's kind of the way things go right now. Um, Jonathan Aaron says, uh, out of these three, who would you want to see at Northwestern? Uh, Ed Orgeron, Butch Jones, or Dan Mullen? Well, I find Orgeron to be very, very entertaining. And having him be one of those sort of like egghead academic institutions, you know, they sort of you know have their pinky in the air as they sip their tea. Like Orgeron mixing with them would be hilarious to me. Um, I actually don't think that Dan Mullen would be a terrible fit at Northwestern. I don't think he probably wants to coach, at least maybe there. But I don't think Mullen would be a terrible fit at a place like that. Thomas Dyson says Arizona State's great to watch on Pac-12 after dark. Uh, yeah, I think it is too. Uh, I like I like Sparky. You know, like the little logo thing they have, the the mascot. I kind of like Sparky. Uh, it's a weird color scheme, but I don't hate it for whatever reason. How many? I did not go to Tempe in two thousand eight. How many are two? Yeah, two thousand eight. Yeah. How many of y'all did go to Tempe? I did not go there. Um, uh, G. Grace Bamba Boy says, "Shout out to Coach Yeah, one of my favorite humans on earth." Yeah, G. Grace. I mean. Uh, you know, our buddy Mike Johnson and a lot of, you know, these other former Alabama players, you know, much the same way we heard Terrence Edwards just absolutely just swear by Coach Rick a moment ago. A lot of those former Alabama guys, they swear by Coach Cochran. They swear by him. Um, he meant so much and still does to so many of those guys in Alabama. And that's why you know, it's sort of hard to put into words, you know, like what he's gone through what he's doing to confront all of that, which is a very courageous thing. And I do hope that Scott Cochran is fueled by the fact that I'm guessing he probably is, but I hope he's fueled by the fact that there are a lot of people who think he hung the moon. They just think he's the just the greatest thing in the world. And that is not a joke. Um, uh, uh, Christy mentioning Mike Leach. Yeah. Mike Leach at Mississippi, you, about, you know, to go back to Michael Carvel, our producer's point, Leach at Mississippi State, obviously, God rest his soul, but Leach at Mississippi State would have been a pretty weird fit. It seems like he fit in pretty well there, but from a personality standpoint, I i mean, I had said for a long time that I didn't think that Leach would have really fit in the SEC very well. I think that Leach did a pretty good job, I think, and I do think that Zach Arnett helped this. Um, I mean, that was the one thing about the Leach era at Mississippi State is they actually played pretty good defense. Arnett was a really good defensive coordinator for Coach Leach. And that, those teams were tough. I mean... Georgia lays waste to everybody. Uh, you know, Mississippi State fought with them for a minute. Uh, I mean, I think I think that Coach Smart would say Mississippi State was pretty tough. You know, the 2020 game certainly was. You know, physical, tough teams. Uh, so I think that Coach Leach, once again, you know, God rest his soul, as weird of a fit as that seemed like it would be, you know, you know at Mississippi State, I think because of the fact they did bring some toughness to the table, um, uh, I think he ended up being kind of an okay fit there. And, like, the one – like I remember this at SEC Media Days a year ago. Like the one thing that he was trying to really push was, you know, hey, you know, look at the way I'm getting my running backs involved in the passing game. You know, you know, judge me by my total use of running backs. That was something that he, I think he wanted to kind of make that the hallmark of his program of, you know, no one's throwing to running backs better than we are. And obviously we never quite saw all of that come together, which is still very sad. Uh, Croaking123 says, Leach is a weird fit for the SEC, but he was a perfect fit at Mississippi State. Made the Ole Miss game amazing. Listen, Egg Bowl is I, – I love the Egg Bowl. I, I, I love it. Y'all know how much I love it. I talk about it all the time. And it's one of those examples of something that rivalries don't have to be prestigious to be great. In fact, sometimes rivalries are the best when they're not prestigious. With all due respect, the Egg Bowl is not prestigious. It's not. Uh, the Egg Bowl is nasty. The Egg Bowl is your relatives getting drunk and getting in a fight after lunch on Thanksgiving. That's what it is. I mean, like, and it is fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, I almost wish I was a better man, uh, but I ain't. Uh, I am here for all of that soap opera drama, you know, uh, uh, distasteful behavior. I love everything about the Egg Bowl, and I always will. Uh, Army Dog says, "Yeah, Army Navy more prestigious for sure. Yeah, that's I mean, these are these are future presidents and senators and whatever else. That's distinguished, right? You know, you get the 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 cadets and the the, the middies, you know, out in the uh, crowd. They're they're dressed up well. The marching in the procession or whatever you call it of the uh, uh, of the student bodies, like that's prestigious. You know, that's that's dignified." 
this is something else entirely. And I love it. Um, Johnny Surf Dog says the Egg Bowl is the Jerry Springer show of college football. In some ways that it is. And as you all know, Jerry Springer was on TV for once in the end. God rest his soul too. But on TV for a very, very long time. <laughs> it's one of those things where we, we, we might not always be proud of what we like. But collectively, <laughs> there are just some things we like. And uh, ugly, nasty family drama sometimes is it. And that is what the Egg Bowl ser- s- s- sells you in a pretty heavy dose. Um, let's see what else. Uh, Bill Sanders says, I didn't go to the Georgia-Arizona State game, but I have been to Sun Devil Stadium a few times. That's really cool. Um, I've not been – I don't think I've even been to the state of Arizona. I've flown over a few times. But I have not been there um, for that. Matthew Dill says, I didn't go to Tempe, but I stood out in the downpour when they came here. Yeah, it did pour down rain that day. Uh, the other thing I remember that that is, that was the day that A.J. Green, <laughs> like he just sort of looked like, you know, like if you ever watch like a youth league football game, there's like just one guy that's just like, like he was sort of the baby Gronk <laughs> of that game. He's blocking a field goal. He's getting catches. Like I remember thinking, and it wasn't even a very good game, uh, you know, period. But I just remember thinking, A.J. Green is just amazing at football. Like, he's <laughs> – I hate to say this because Georgia, to be honest, was not that great in 2009. I just remember thinking, A.J. Green as a player is so much better than this game is. Like, he's just out there just doing all kinds of stuff in a game that was not worthy of his talents. And honesty compels me to admit that. Philip Jordan Wells says, uh, Dan Mullen should be the next coach at Adams College. I do wonder if Mullen wants to coach again. I, I do. Because for all the bad fits you want to talk about, when it's all said and done, Dan Mullen was a was actually a pretty good fit for Mississippi State. Uh, as as non Southern as he is, and as Southern as uh, Starkville can kind of be, Mullen I think was actually a pretty good fit for Mississippi State. I think they liked him. Uh, uh, I think he liked them. Scott Strickland was his athletic director. It seemed like he was a pretty good fit there too. It seems like they sort of had a pretty good thing going now. Once again, go back to the Peter Prince we mentioned a moment ago. If you're at Mississippi State and Florida comes calling, you sort of got to do it. And the funny thing about the Mullen is, is like, you know, the, I think there was reason to believe at the time, you know, Megan Mullen kind of said it. They didn't, they didn't like, uh, you know, their time at Gainesville necessarily. But there is still that thing inside of coaches, even, you know, unsuccessful coaches like Dan Mullen, there's still that thing inside of coaches. It's like just the clarion call right the sirens call or whatever you want to call it you know uh, that gravitational pull towards the highest level that you can achieve and um you know at that sort of middish level type program at mississippi state mullen actually had a decent thing going um bill sanders mentioning the midnight express versus the mulkey brothers which you better believe i'd watch that right now any iteration of the Midnights. Bobby Eaton, Dennis Condry, Bobby Eaton, Stan Lane. You give me an old WTBS 605 on a Saturday night, Midnight Express versus the Mulkey Brothers. I would take that right now. Um, uh, let's see what else. Barry Watkins laughing at me for saying, I wish I was a better man, but I ain't. Uh, sometimes that is the case. Uh, let's see what else. Um, Matt Rukavina says random 2021 title moment when George Pickens burned Kool-Aid and McKinstry for the diving catch yeah I've said this before and I don't make fun of players very much but I think that Kool-Aid and McKinstry may, may be my favorite Alabama player <laughs> just for various reasons Um, let us see what else um yeah, uh, I guess Phil Rogers kind of reminding us of some of the history of Jeff Driscoll's uh, past there at Florida. Yeah, so maybe a little bit complicated. Maybe a little complicated. All right, uh, a couple final comments. We're getting ready to go here. Oh, I'm sorry to hear this. Brandon Griffin said their family dog Nemo passed away yesterday. He was a DGD. Brandon, I'm very sorry to hear that. Uh, I know how many great memories it must be of, you know, collected over the years. Uh, with a great dog like that, and I am very, very sorry for that. So uh, we will certainly keep you all in mind there. Brandon, thank you for sharing that, and I am truly, truly very sorry. I really am. 
Bill Sanders also mentioning Mulkey Mania running wild. Yeah. So I remember, like, you know, and I promise we won't talk very much wrestling because some of y'all hate it when I do. But uh, the Mulkeys were like, like, it's kind of funny now everything is politically correct. It used to be in wrestling, the the wrestlers that got paid to lose, you called them jobbers. That was just kind of what they were called. But apparently that's, like, politically incorrect now. So they're known as enhancement talents. <laughs> Like even like, even like wrestling is sort of somewhat PC in the fact that you don't you can't call them jobbers anymore. Guys that were paid to do a job and uh, you know get beat up and and make the other wrestler look good, we have to call them enhancement talents now. And so that's what the Mulkies were. They were enhancement talents. But one time they let them win a match, and it, I remember thinking it was a very big deal. <laughs> I do remember thinking it was a very big deal. And Mulkey Mania was running wild, uh, for sure. How about Bobby Powell checking in from Albuquerque, New Mexico? Talk about a state I'd love to visit. That's that, that's a really cool place to be. Bobby, I'm glad that you're here. Thank you for checking in. And uh, one of these days, maybe we'll come out and visit you in uh, New Mexico. I've, I've often said that when it comes to like, the college football bowl structure, obviously you want to be in the best bowls. But if Georgia was ever, you know, kind of a middle-tier program, mid as it gets, if, if they were kind of a middle-tier program, I'd rather go to a lower tier bowl game than a middle middle tier bowl game if that makes sense. Uh, like one of these days, you know, if Georgia was not very good, like last year, Florida went to the Las Vegas Bowl and they got embarrassed out there. But I'm guessing a lot of Gators fans probably didn't care because um, uh, they were in Las Vegas. Like I think it'd be fun to go to the Las Vegas Bowl uh, or go to the New Mexico Bowl. I think that'd be really fun. Play like the third best team from the MAC or whatever it is, but just go to New Mexico. I think it'd be fun. You know, there's the Bahamas Bowl. I'd love to go to New Mexico at some point in time. I'm not sure when I will. I guess Georgia was there for the 83 Final Four. That was at the pit. Is that right? Uh, I'd love to go to New Mexico at some point in time. Bobby says to come out first week of October during the hot air balloon fiesta. Yeah, my guess is fall in New Mexico is probably pretty nice. My guess is that's probably pretty nice. That's good stuff. Uh, Scott Gentry, looking forward to seeing that great wall of Georgia knocking people off the ball in the future. That's going to be a lot of fun. Going to be a lot of fun, you think. Uh, let us see what else. <laughs> K-Dog says, I can't go to <laughs> New Mexico because I'm only going to visit places I can take a cruise to. That's very funny. That's very funny. Um, Yeah, uh, Thomas Dyson says, I'd love to hit up a game in New Mexico. Yeah, I do think it'd be fun. I do think it'd be fun. Um. Uh, you got the New Mexico Lobos and the New Mexico State Aggies. That'd be pretty fun. Um, let's see what else. We gotta get ready to go. Thomas Tyson says it's beautiful country. That's the thing. Is like, you know, like I've been, you know, L.A., Las Vegas, places like that, San Francisco. But as far as like some of like the like just sort of long stretches of like west you know western United States driving and just seeing the landform changes and things like that, I haven't done nearly enough of that. But boy, I sure would like to. I sure would like to. Paul Moon would also like to go back to to Boulder at some point in time too. Uh, that'd be really fun. That'd be really fun. Um, Alan Hampton says Coach Rick was as classy of a coach that has ever coached anywhere, any sport, at any level. And Alan, I would agree with you on that. I really would. Uh, I really would. Yeah, Paul, you're a lot like me. I've done every kind of East Coast travel you can sort of do, I guess. I have not done nearly enough kind of like, you know, Southwest, you know, up towards Big Sky Country. I'd love to do more than that. And as somebody talking about Pac-12 after dark a little earlier, I like the college sports out there, right? Like, I mean – does anybody have a better looking helmet than Wyoming does? Like I like I just like college sports in general, I guess, but I like, you know, BYU games. You ever see like a baseball game at BYU, the mountains in the background? Like college sports out west is kind of cool. Now they don't care about it the way we care about it here, but there are some people in each of these spots that do care about it. Uh you know, I, I just think that's really cool. I think that's really cool. All right. Uh final comments a uh, uga boy for light brunetti says when i was in the army i was in new mexico it was nice but uh very deserted in a lot of areas yeah i guess that's kind of part of it too right you do have a lot more expansive wide open space first of all thank you for your service to our country and um you know like my dad told the story because when he was uh in the army he was briefly stationed in manhattan kansas he said you know, he got there at night uh went to bed woke up in the morning like you know it's like there's big mountain or something like that 
Yeah, you know, so you just see like because my my dad grew up in Georgia and had never really been anywhere before going to the army, but you know went to Vietnam and you know got moved down around all over the place. It just it, it's interesting. It's it you know that kind of life when you're enlisted that's a very interesting thing. Um, uh, William Perry says I uh, once said that I really wanted to go to the Independence Bowl during the time Georgia was going to the same Florida Bowl games over and over again. Then it happened, and I regretted saying it. So, did you go to the Independence Bowl? Because I I, I I did not. Uh, I know when Georgia was there a couple of times, I did not go there. Uh, it's always cold, right? I mean, like you don't really think of Louisiana being cold, but this is this is Louisiana in December, so it's cold, uh, and there's just not really a ton to do, right? I mean, that's like. Uh, you know, Shreveport, I guess Bossier City's right there. Like, these are places that probably have about the least to do of anywhere, right? I mean, it's like, this, <laughs> these are not much of destinations. You know, there's plenty of places in Louisiana that'd be super fun to go to. Uh, these are not true destinations. I, I, that's a really good point. Um, Paul Moon says the Rockies are wild to see for the first time if you've only seen the apps. Yeah, those, like... And obviously around here we have those, you know, sort of rounded top mountains and those jagged pointy mountains are just a different kind of thing. Uh, Holly Aby checking in from Tifton. We got a great little contingent of dog fans down there in Tiff County. We love that. Um, Thomas Tyson says, I walk outside every day and see the Rockies. It never gets old. Thomas, that's really cool. Um uh, Matt Presley checking in from Bend, Oregon, saying the dogs are still playing in Eugene in the coming years. We need a dog river float here in Bend, Oregon. I like the idea of that. I've also wanted to do like you know the Tennessee River thing at some point in time when Georgia plays at Tennessee. But yeah, but going up to Eugene would be really fun. Uh, and Matt's great to have you checking in from up there uh, in Oregon. But that would that would be uh, that'd be a really fun thing. Um, Mike Brown says, "Wasn't the Liberty Bowl the last game that Bear Bryant coached?" And I believe that it was. George was obviously in the Liberty Bowl in 2016. I think I remember hearing that trivia uh, before about uh, about Coach uh, Bryant. I'd go to Memphis. Oh, when Georgia went to Arkansas in 2020, we stopped, you know, kind of stayed in Memphis for a night. Um, that's fun. Uh, there's plenty of good food there. I was with my family, so we were doing a little bit more of the family-friendly part of that. But if you want to do the Beale Street stuff and things like that, that's fun. Um, like downtown Memphis is not bad. We did go to the, <laughs> the old pyramid where uh, Memphis State is now just known as Memphis – where Memphis used to play its games back when, like, Penny Hardaway was there, the old Pyramid, they've turned into, like, a gigantic Bass Pro Shop. I mean, this is – it's like it's like the the Disney World of outdoors. Um, it's wild, and we went there. It, it's actually really cool. Uh, Thomas Tyson says, blues and barbecue, that's all I need. Yeah, you got Gus's Fried Chicken, like the original location. That's really good. I'm all about all that kind of stuff. Um Uh, Jonathan Aaron asking about the best leech rants. He certainly had plenty of good ones over the years. No doubt about that. All right, we're going to go. Um, Nature Gator says that Tifton is the gnat capital of the world. Is it the gnat capital of the world? Because, listen, there's a lot of South Georgia places that got a lot of gnats. Uh, uh, and, listen, I love South Georgia, but uh, there are a lot of – you have to do that thing with your, like, your breath where you're like a – you kind of blow them off. You can tell us – you can tell like a true authentic South Georgian because he's kind of doing that little – thing where he blows off the gnats they just get kind of good at that um paul moon says we got a gus is down the street here in Chambly. yeah there's some so gus is kind of a chain now i don't know if the chains are are good or not but the original gus's is, is uh is big time big time oh nature gator grew up in tifton there you go i always used to hear that like tifton was like the i don't even know if this is true but this is what i used to hear growing up that it was like the hotel room capital of the world or something like that that because it's on 75 and i mean you know 75 my whole life has just been you know million cars driving to florida on 75 and so like some sort of stat like one of those sort of like cliff clavin type things of like per capita nope where had more hotel rooms now obviously this is per capita right you know based on the population nobody had more hotel rooms than tifton did i don't know if that's true or not and maybe it was never true um Matt Presley says, uh, Gainesville, Georgia, or nothing, B.A. Yeah, listen, uh, love my hometown for sure. Love my hometown for sure. Um, love Gainesville, Georgia. William Perry says he was in uh, Shreveport, and it was cold. I remember that. Uh, I, I did not go, but I do remember it. Just, it just seemed like it was miserable. It really did. And I love the dogs. I love traveling to watch them play. 
<laughs> I don't know there are going to be any Dog Nation invasions to Shreveport anytime soon. Uh, uh, Nature Gator, speaking of hotel, he said I, he worked at the bus boy at the Holiday Inn on uh, I-75. I saw this picture the other day, and we're, we got to get ready to go because now we're just completely lost the plot. And I'd never seen this before, of like Holiday Inns in like the 1970s, and they had built these like domes, and the domes had like mini golf and like indoor pools and like shuffleboard, all this kind of stuff, and it looked awesome. It looked amazing, and I remember thinking, I'd do this right now. I'd go stay at a roadside Holiday Inn and do this right now. I'd never seen this before. I know that, like, I guess back around that same time or probably earlier than that, that's when, like, Howard Johnson started getting famous and they had, you know, whatever else, kind of like when the roadside motel started getting popular, I guess. But I saw this, like, old picture of, like, a Holiday Inn from the 70s, and I'm thinking, why don't they do that now? Like, I feel like, you know, that may be – chain that somewhat regressed based on what they were in the 1970s. It was like a little mini amusement park inside a Holiday Inn. It was amazing. Um, uh, all right, we got to go. Anything else? I think not. Let, let's just wrap it up for today. We'll come back and finish strong on a Friday. Appreciate you being here. Check out RS Andrews online at rsandrews.com for your air conditioning, heating, plumbing, and electric needs. Uh, hot outside. It was really hot yesterday. Wow, it was hot. And so that's why you want good AC. And good AC means getting it tuned back up to stay good. So find them online, rsandrews.com, for more on that. They'll get you tuned back up to factory fresh specs. They'll keep you cool and comfortable all summer long. So find them online, rsandrews.com. Y'all have a great day. Back here tomorrow, Dog Nation Daily, presented by Meriwether and Tharp. Uh, Jake Fromm going to be on the show tomorrow. That'll be fun. Jeff Sintel as well. Jeff's trying to go on vacation, but I'm going to drag him on the show one more time before he does. So we'll do that then, and we'll see all of you back here tomorrow for it. R.S. Andrews Cooldown, Dog Nation Daily, presented by Meriwether and Tharp. Have a great day, everybody.